our next film is a real delight, something quite special. More proof that the animated feature film is alive well again now as the 80s come to a close. The movie is Disney Studios' The Little Mermaid. On November 17, 1989, Disney released The Little Mermaid into theaters, and the company would never be the same. The film rescued Disney's animation department and led them into a period known as the Disney Renaissance. The heart of The Little Mermaid resides in Howard Ashman and Alan Menken's Academy Award-winning music. Ashman and Menken pushed for the film to be formatted like a Broadway musical, with songs that were integral to the film's plot. They would use this approach with two more hit Disney films, Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin, before Howard Ashman's untimely passing due to AIDS complications in 1991. With their films so deeply rooted in Broadway musicals, they seemed like natural fits to get the true Broadway treatment. Both Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin became long-running Tony Award-winning hits, but what would come in the middle of those two successes would prove to be one of Disney's most polarizing Broadway musicals. This was Disney's The Little Mermaid on Broadway. Following Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King, The Little Mermaid was set to be Disney's third Broadway musical based on one of their animated films. In the spring of 2000, it was revealed that Matthew Bourne was attached to direct The Little Mermaid for Broadway. Bourne was a two-time Tony Award-winning director and choreographer for his avant-garde production of Swan Lake in 1999. Disney hoped Bourne would do for The Little Mermaid what Julie Taymor did for The Lion King. A workshop was set for early 2003. However, just before the workshop took place, it was announced that Bourne would be departing the project due to it being too time-consuming. It was later revealed that Bourne's vision for the show was straying too far away from what Disney wanted. Matthew loved the Little Mermaid movie, but what he wanted to explore mostly was Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid, and that's not what we wanted to do. So rather than either of us trying to persuade the other to change the essential creative direction of the show, we decided to move on to other things. Disney pushed ahead with the workshop, which included Hairspray's Carrie Butler as Ariel, Thoroughly Modern Millie's Gavin Creel as Prince Eric, and Sideshow's Emily Skinner as Ursula. But without a director, the decision was made to shelve the project until someone came along with the right vision for the show. It would take nearly two years for Disney to move ahead with The Little Mermaid after landing Francesca Zambello to direct the production. Zambello was well known in the opera world, directing larger-than-life productions in Europe, along with frequent collaborators George Sipin and Tatiana Noganova, who would both join Zambello for The Little Mermaid. Zambello had worked with Disney before, directing the beloved Aladdin A Musical Spectacular for Disney's California Adventure. The Little Mermaid would be Zambello's Broadway debut as a director. Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Doug Wright would join the team to write the book for the musical. Wright won the Tony and the Pulitzer for his 2004 Broadway play, I Am My Own Wife. The Little Mermaid would be his first time writing for a family audience. Lyricist Glenn Slater would join Alan Menken to write new songs for the musical. Slater had previously worked with Menken on Disney's Home on the Range and the world premiere of Sister Act the Musical. Slater would have the challenge of filling Howard Ashman's shoes and writing new songs that lived up to the beloved songs from the movie. Music director Michael Kazarin would write new arrangements for the score and ensure that the new songs fit into the world of the musical. Kazarin had worked on nearly every Alan Menken project since Disney's Pocahontas. Auditions were held in 2006 to find the right cast to bring the iconic animated characters to life. A Broadway newcomer named Sierra Bogus was chosen to play Ariel. Bogus had wowed audiences as Christine Dye in the Las Vegas production of The Phantom of the Opera. Her stunning voice and resemblance to a Disney princess made Bogus the perfect match to play the titular heroine. Bright young women, sick of swimming, ready to stay.
Broadway veteran Sean Palmer was cast as Prince Eric. Palmer had multiple Broadway credits to his name, including The Apple Tree starring Kristen Chenoweth. Palmer also had a recurring role on Sex and the City. Prince Eric would be Palmer's first starring role on Broadway. Broadway fans speculated for months about who could play the sea witch Ursula. Would a legendary Broadway diva like Bette Midler or Patti Lapone don her tentacles? Or would Disney go another direction and make Ursula a drag role? After all, Ursula's design was based on the iconic drag queen Divine. A casting notice for the role made it clear that Broadway's Ursula would indeed be a departure from the movie, making her younger and, as the casting notice put it, sexy, sultry, and statuesque. Disney found who they were looking for in an old friend. In the time since Sherry Renee Scott played Amneris in Disney's Aida, she'd become a bona fide star with lead roles in the last five years in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, for which she received her first Tony nomination. Scott would put a new spin on one of Disney's all-time great villains. Longing to be thinner, that one wants to get the girl, and do I help them? Yes, indeed! Those poor and fortunate souls, so sad, so true. They come flocking to my cauldron, crying spells, there's a please, and I help them. Yes, I do! Jetsam, one of Ursula's evil eel sidekicks, would be played by Derek Baskin. Baskin was starring in the hit Broadway musical The 25th Annual Putnam County Spelling Bee as comfort counselor Mitch Mahoney when he first auditioned for The Little Mermaid. And I originally auditioned for not the part that I got, I auditioned for Sebastian. And it got down between me and Titus and Titus ended up taking it. They were like, but we, we want you in any capacity that we can have you. So we have this other role um, and if you are, if you want it, it's quick, right? Because you have to get over a rejection, right? right. Like, well, I came here for this. <laughs> and they're like, what about this? And I was like, let me get over this first. Right, and so right. I got over it. Baskin would be joined by Tyler Maynard to complete the dastardly duo of Flotsam and Jetsam. Zakia Young made her Broadway debut in The Little Mermaid. Young was just returning to the theater industry after an extended break when she decided to audition for the show on a whim. After multiple callbacks, Young booked the job. It didn't feel real, to be honest. Like, it, it's something you dream about. And when it actually happens, you're just like, wait, did they make a mistake? Like, I'll be honest, half of the rehearsal process, I was thinking, they're going to realize they made a mistake. They wanted another black girl who was more experienced. And I'm looking and I see Norm Lewis and Sherry Renee Scott and Tom Schumacher and I'm just like, whoa. And to see a rendering of a Mer sister based on me, like my whole body type and everything, it was just, it, it was honestly a pinch me moment. Young remembers the moments she realized she'd be playing a Disney princess. When I got my offer, my offer was ensemble. So I'm thinking, all right, I'll be like maybe a sea sponge or somebody off to the side. And when I went for my wig fitting, I remember I was sitting there and our wig designer uh, said, okay, so you're gonna be a Merce sister, uh, a maid, a lily pad. And I was like, wait, I'm gonna be a Merce sister? Arbender Robinson was getting his wig, wig fitting at the same time. And he was like, oh my gosh, I'm so happy for you. And he was like, well, I'm also a Prince Eric understudy. And I was like, what? So it was just this explosion of, oh my gosh, I get to be a princess. So that was my first clue that they were gonna do something very different. Unlike the film, the Broadway version of The Little Mermaid would feature a diverse cast. Kids and adults of different races and body types would be able to see themselves on stage. On the first day of rehearsal when I walked in and I was like, are there like, is a third of the cast black? Oh my God, like 
It was such a beautiful moment as all of the Blackters looked at each other like, oh my gosh, you and you and you. I want to say if there were 30 people of, in the cast, 13 of us were Black. So mm -hmm. a third of the cast was Black. And then there were also Asian Americans and there were also Hispanic Americans. So like the other two thirds wasn't just completely white. There were also other ethnicities in there. I have to credit Tom Schumacher, who was the head mm -hmm. of the theatricals. And I have to credit Francesca Zambella, who was our uh, director. And uh, our first day of rehearsal, she had something very interesting to say. She said, contrary to popular belief, the majority of the world is not white. Mm -hmm. And so she said, how do we reflect that in this world? And so she said, this is why we have so much color here. And that why there's not a token black person and a token Asian and everyone else is white. And it was just glorious because we're used to having maybe one or two. Um, but to see so many people come in, like I knew Norm Lewis was gonna be there and Titus had been announced, but I didn't know anybody else of color was going to be in the cast. So every show I would look in the audience and try and find like the little black girls seeing me and Cicely Daniels to see the two black Mer sisters who are curvy and dark skinned and gorgeous and full of magic. It, it just, I get excited thinking about it still. To depict the sea creatures swimming on stage, director Francesca Zambello wouldn't utilize flying like Disney's previous two musicals, Tarzan and Mary Poppins. Instead, Zambello would find inspiration in a fad popular with the 12 and under crowd. Freedom is a wheel in your soul. It's Heelys, and it's all about fun. The cast of The Little Mermaid would glide across the stage in Heelys, or as they were dubbed for the show, Merblades. The young actors who played Flounder were the only cast members who wore actual Heelys. The rest of the cast wore specially designed dance boots with a wheel in the heel. The task of choreographing for a cast in Heelys was taken up by Stephen Meir. Meir would use the unique nature of the Heelys to create the underwater movement of the show but performing in Heelys took some getting used to for most of the cast. For me, honestly, it was hard because I, I had never done anything like that. You got to find your balance. It's just a, a new way of kind of being, you know what I right. mean? If you're not used to it, you know, it's going to take you a minute. So it took me it took me a second. But it came, I, I, I ended up uh, kind of mastering it. I lived in Brooklyn at the time, so I remember going and buying a pair of Heelys once I got the job so that I could practice. So I would be in the park and these little kids would be healing past me and I, me and my dude at the time would be out there trying to heal me. It took a, it took a minute. If I could do it all again, I would have definitely worked more on switching what foot you have in front because I always heal with my left foot forward. And when you do that, if you just put your left heel forward and stand, your hip, your hips shift slightly. But they did have a wonderful physical therapist and I saw her Frequently. Tatiana Noganova's costumes were out of this world. Derek Baskin remembers seeing them for the first time. Honestly, I was a little scared because like, oh, yeah. I was like, <laughs> I don't know what I signed up for. Uh, you can see like these, a drawing is different from like, now put this spandex on. I was like, oh God, I got to wear this bodysuit. It's not going to hide anything. The eel costume had gone through there's so many different variations. At first, they kind of wanted us to look like detectives. And like, we had these helmets, we had these uh, LED like orbs, like here, that looked like mm -hmm. eyes. And so like, that was supposed to be our head. Looking at it on stage, they were like, actually don't need that. Let's actually play with morphing from human to like aquatic animal. It's hard to create stuff like that. And especially you got people playing fish, right? So it's like, how do we do that? And they, I think they did a really good job. The concept of like their costuming was really cool. In 2007, Disney announced that Beauty and the Beast would be closing on Broadway after 13 years to make room for The Little Mermaid at the Lundfontein Theater. The same weekend that Beauty and the Beast closed on Broadway, The Little Mermaid had its very first public performance. The show premiered at the Ellie Calkins Opera House in Denver, Colorado on July 26, 2007. The Little Mermaid sold every ticket available to the public for its entire out-of-town tryout. It was very exciting. You saw mermaid flags everywhere and the whole town was excited for it. It was great because Sierra is from the Denver area. 
So it was awesome to have like the hometown girl making a Broadway debut and starring in this huge musical. Sierra Vargas, like, you know, she was in all these scenes since her Broadway debut and she just did such a beautiful job with, with the role and she was also very, very consistent. With the out-of-town trials, they were working a lot on the show. We had costume changes, we had scenes that were cut. I remember all of a sudden we had a new arrangement of Kiss the Girl. So we um, were called into rehearsal that morning, learned the new arrangement, and then put it in the show that night. Derek Baskin and Tyler Maynard stole the show in Denver, but the creative team soon realized they were maybe stealing a little too much of the show. They, were, they gave us all kinds of stuff, and we were in so many scenes. And in Denver, the director was like, so here's the thing. <laughs> The audiences and the kids are liking you more than like everyone else. <laughs> so we have to actually take you guys out of some things because the show shouldn't be about you guys. And so they end up cutting a bunch of our stuff. Um, but we super had a pretty good time. While most of the changes in Denver came from the creative team, some were requested by the cast themselves. I did discuss some problems I had with stereotypical representation for um, two of the Murr sisters' wigs, uh, mine included. But that was, it's part of learning how to speak up and learning how to handle your business. I was just kind of like, well, this is a problem and it needs to be solved because if we're doing this so that everyone can see themselves, you can't have the two black Murr sisters up here in something that is offensive. And once I talked to Francesca, she was like, yeah, absolutely, we'll change it. So I, I do think that that is one of the best lessons that I learned. And I really don't think that there was any malicious intent at all. I do think that it was a microaggression that snuck in there that needed to be addressed. And it was. The Little Mermaid ended its Denver run on September 9th and prepared for its Broadway debut but two cast members wouldn't be making the jump to Broadway. Our two flounders went through puberty. So the two flounders that we worked with in Denver did not open the show with us. So that was heartbreaking because, you know, it's like you can't control that. But we were, we love to welcome Trevor and Brian to the show. Um, but yeah, Cody and JJ were definitely missed. The Little Mermaid began Broadway previews on November 3rd, 2007. But after only five performances, the show would be brought to a grinding halt due to something that not even Disney could control. Local One, the Stagehands Union, went on strike on November 10th, 2007 due to a breakdown in contract negotiations. The strike shut down most of Broadway, including The Little Mermaid. Due to the strike, opening night was postponed. The strike ended after 19 days, which, until the COVID-19 pandemic, was the largest Broadway shutdown in history. Opening night of The Little Mermaid was rescheduled for January 10, 2008. Opening night was a star-studded affair. Amongst the attendees were Pat Carroll, the original voice of Ursula, and Jody Benson, the original voice of Ariel. After nearly a decade of development, The Little Mermaid was finally open. The cast and creative team celebrated their hard work at the opening night party. But as they partied, the critics were busy tearing the show apart. My parents came out for opening, and the next morning, my dad rushed to the bodega downstairs and got all these newspapers. I didn't even know my dad knew to check for the reviews. And he was like, Z, they really don't like Disney. And it was like, some of these reviews are just me. I admit that in the past I've been a nasty. They weren't kidding when they called me, well, a witch. Some people just had an ax to grind, which is unfortunate. It's like with Disney, people kind of just like to hate on Disney, right? They don't want, mm -hmm. you know, Broadway to be Disney-fied or whatever. They don't want Times Square, you know, they, they'll say that even like Times Square is very Disney now. They have an uphill battle because like they produce really good work but it's like, because it's sometimes very shiny, um, mm -hmm. uh, people are like, you know, it's not New York-y. Do you know what I mean? Or it's not theatery. It's like right. theme park -y. 
I don't know if anybody was really surprised by the reviews. There was definitely an anti-corporate feeling um, that all of us were aware of. It does hurt a little bit, you know, I think, and I, I don't think the reviews hurt. I think what stung a little bit were the snide comments from fellow actors in the industry. You know what I mean? Because it's like, look, we went through a lot to book this show. Let's not forget. <laughs> there could have been some truth to what they were saying, uh, because everyone has an opinion and not, you, you, you know, you're entitled to your opinion. Um, I'm also entitled mm -hmm. to mine. And so like, you know, if someone doesn't like something like that's their prerogative. Right, and yeah. and I, I learned not to take it personally. There are things that you know, all right, this isn't perfect, but I'm happy to be here and I'm happy to have a job and I'm happy to be telling a story. So what I tried to focus on was just that. It's not really about what I feel should be fixed. Let me do my best job every time I'm on stage and let me tell the story and just be grateful for it. Despite some overly harsh reviews, The Little Mermaid did have critics who championed the show. Richard Zoglin's review for Time Magazine was titled In Defense of Disney. Zoglin praised the show, saying all in all, it was one of the most ravishing things I have ever seen on a Broadway stage. He ended his review with these observations. Yes, it's a fairy tale aimed chiefly at children, but would it be rude to ask why Broadway's fairy tales for adults, like Oklahoma and Guys and Dolls, can become musical theater classics, while the ones directed at kids become critical dartboards? Or to wish, just once, that Disney might get a little credit for recruiting some of the most adventurous theater artists in the world to bring new ideas in staging and storytelling to a mass theater audience, kids and adults alike? For better or worse, The Little Mermaid was the talk of the town. Tickets sold well throughout the rest of the winter and into the spring. But soon, people would be talking about The Little Mermaid for a tragic reason. On May 10th, 2008, just minutes before the show began, Broadway legend Adrian Bailey, a member of the show's ensemble, fell through a trap door in the floor of the ship's set piece that was suspended above the stage. Bailey fell nearly 30 feet onto the stage, breaking multiple bones and shattering his pelvis. Adrian's accident, that was, that was very traumatic. And we instantly, we, we became that much closer because of it. That experience taught me even more so to speak up because we had been saying things but I think it's like, I learned to be the squeaky wheel. When it comes to safety, be the squeaky wheel. Bailey filed a lawsuit against Disney and the companies responsible for the set design and automation. The outcome of the case has not been made public and may be ongoing. Although Bailey recovered from the fall, his injuries have prevented him from performing on Broadway since The Little Mermaid. Just three days after Adrian Bailey's accident, the nominations for the 2008 Tony Awards were announced. The Little Mermaid only received two nominations for Alan Menken, Howard Ashman, and Glenn Slater for Best Score, and Natasha Katz for Best Lighting Design. The show would end the night empty-handed, but Sierra Bogus would perform an abridged version of Part of Your World during the broadcast. The Little Mermaid continued to sell well during the 2008 summer season, but the fall would bring hardships for all of Broadway. The 2008 financial crisis saw a steep drop in ticket sales for most Broadway shows. One by one, shows began to post closing notices, leading to almost a third of all shows on Broadway closing by the end of January 2009. The Little Mermaid weathered the storm and hoped to turn things around in the spring and summer. In order to increase ticket sales, teen heartthrob Drew Seeley was cast as Prince Eric for a limited run. Unfortunately, it wouldn't be enough. On June 30th, Disney announced that The Little Mermaid would close on August 30th, just short of two years after opening. As you grow as an actor and as a business person, you start to read the writing on the wall. Was it a shock for me? Yeah, because it was my first show. But then not really, because as you started to see, like sometimes we would be like, oh my gosh, the house is pretty empty, or if it was full, 
you would find out that, oh, they papered the house, or all of a sudden it would be like, hey, you have comps for this performance, which is great. But you know, when people, when you start getting too many comps, you're like, uh oh, this is not good. This is not good. This is not good. Yeah, it, it was a little sad, a little sad. It was more um, that I didn't want to leave those people and I didn't want to have to look for another job. <laughs> And it was a little bit scary. The show went out with a bang, selling out its final 16 performances. The Little Mermaid's Broadway journey had come to an end, brought down by harsh reviews and an economic recession. A national tour was planned to launch in 2010 but never materialized. The Broadway production of The Little Mermaid would never be seen again. Like Tarzan, Disney took The Little Mermaid overseas to do further work on the show. In 2012, Disney teamed up with Sage Entertainment to produce a new Little Mermaid for the Netherlands. Disney would call on Bob Crowley to design new sets and would hire Glenn Cassell to direct. Cassell would make multiple changes to Doug Wright's book, making the show focus more on Ariel and Triton's father-daughter relationship. Cassell's changes would be implemented in the script licensed out to amateur and professional productions of the show. Once the licensing rights were available, The Little Mermaid became one of the most popular titles for theaters to produce. Tuacon Amphitheater's production featured both water and wires, the two things that Broadway director Francesca Zambello resisted against using. Theaters all over the world would put their own stamp on Disney's classic tale. By 2020, The Little Mermaid was one of the most produced musicals for high schools across the U.S. In 2016, a national tour also directed by Glenn Cassell and co-produced by two regional theaters hit the road and played major cities across America. The tour featured storybook-like designs and brand new costumes. Well, almost brand new. A few costumes from the Broadway production made their way into the national tour, including the Flotsam and Jetsam costumes and the Maid costumes. The tour was generally well received and a financial success. Depending on who you ask, The Little Mermaid was either one of the best Disney musicals or one of the worst. But whatever one feels about the Broadway production, it was refreshing to see Disney take such a major creative risk with the show. No Disney musical that has come since The Little Mermaid has been quite as creative or out of the box. The cast of The Little Mermaid have gone on to do great things in the world of television, movies, theater, and beyond but their time in The Little Mermaid remains a special memory. It, it, it was just such a happy time, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I have lifelong friends because of it. Uh, Daniel Watts, uh, Ephraim Sykes, that was our first show together. That was his Broadway debut. Those two guys, they're like my little brothers. And me and Sherry Renee Scott, we just developed this very tight and uh, very close friendship. Honestly, I had just an enjoyable time. I hadn't just, I had the best time, I did. I definitely uh, still hold all my mermaid people close in my heart. And you know, we, we just lost, we lost two cast members, uh, Eric Lawan Summers and Merwin Ford, and we miss them. I will forever be grateful to Disney and to the creative team, everybody involved for giving me a shot for actually seeing me and seeing that I could be a princess because I didn't even know I could be a princess. The fact that I got to be an example for all the little black girls in the audience, it, it's something that I'll never forget. And I'm just so grateful. Like what we get to do for a living is a blessing. And the fact that I have some lifelong friends, it's just icing on the cake. I mean, is anything perfect? No, but we're not looking for perfection. Life isn't perfect. Uh, but I can definitely give credit where credit is due and say that Disney literally changed my life. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I know something's starting right now.